Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. Design is to give meaning to people. What would you love people to love? I'm quoting from my guest of today. He's a professor of leadership and innovation at the Stockholm School of Economics, where he co-directs the Garden Center for Design and Leadership. He's also a faculty member at Harvard Business School, where he teaches integrated design, and he's a co-founder of Leading Lab, the Laboratory of Leadership, Design and Innovation at the School of Management of Polytechnic of Milan. His research focuses on how to create innovation loved by people, both the users and the creators. He explores how leaders and organizations generate radically new visions and make these visions become real. He's the author of two iconic books on the topic, Overcrowded, Design Meaningful Products in a World Awash with Ideas, and Design Driven Innovation, a book that has been translated in eight different languages. His research on the management of design and design clusters has been awarded with the Compasso d'Oro, the most prestigious design award in Italy. And he has issued more than 150 articles on topics, including developing products on internet time, innovating through design, and the innovative power of criticism. He's in the Hall of Fame of the Journal of Product Innovation Management and has served as advisor to executives and senior manager at a variety of manufacturing and service firms, including Ferrari, Ducati, P&G, Unilever, Gucci, Samsung, IBM, J&J, Nestlé, Philips, 3M, and many others. Roberto Verganti, welcome to In Your Shoes. Roberto, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Ciao Mauro, can I say ciao just to, to be a little more family style? It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you and, and, and with everyone that is connected. You say family style, actually we know each other very, very well, right? Uh, yeah. I actually met you when I was still a student in Polytechnic of Milano. <laughs> uh, we talk about that, about this probably... Uh, you don't even remember when that happened. There were like 450 students there in front of you. You are the teacher of, I think, macroeconomics or economics at the fourth year. And you have been my teacher for just a few months. And then I left and I went to Dublin to study for one year with an exchange program. So I, I didn't have the pleasure to be completely, fully your student. But but then uh, over the years, we, we met again and, and we became friends and we've been doing so many things together, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, you met me really at the beginning of, of, my, of my path into the design world. And actually, that's, I think, a very interesting way to start this conversation. You are not a designer. You are, you, you, your background is in business. You work in the business world. But in the meantime, you are one of the most renowned and, and iconic, I dare to say, uh, ambassador of design in the world and ambassador of design in the business world. You, you have been helping all of us in so many different ways through your consultancy and mostly through your books, Design Driven Innovation, Overcrowded. How did it happen that a business person became so passionate about design and then a, a vocal ambassador of this discipline in the world? Uh, first of all, Mauro, may, maybe there is a secret behind that, that I'm an engineer. <laughs> so, uh, and then, and then uh, but in reality it's true, I never practiced engineering uh, in reality. As, as soon as I graduated, I started to work in the business school of Politecnico. And what happened is that at the beginning I was doing research, given my background in engineering, I was doing research on the management of innovation. And at that time, innovation meant technology-based. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so I went to Harvard in 1997, 1988 to do research on the, uh, how companies develop software in you know, a company like Netscape. I mean, I, if I only say the name, it's unbelievable. It's <laughs> Uh, uh, but, you know, it started, they started this movement about uh, agile development, iterative software development, all this kind of thing. And then I came back to Italy. Uh, and one thing that I learned in, in Harvard is that it's very difficult to do research if you don't have 
good material in front of you. I mean, it's very good, easy to do research in software if you are in Boston, but if you are in Italy, at that time there was not much software. But Italy was well known for design. So at that time, Politecnico di Milano created the first ever graduate school of design in Italy. People don't know that. People know that Italy is well known for design, but uh, there was no graduate school of design in Italy until 1997, 1998, where you basically, you were one, yeah, yeah. one of the was the first year I, I joined. Exactly. 93, 94 was the first year I joined in 94, 95 was the second year. So, so and that's the reason I came at the fourth year. So in 98, when I came back to, to I really met you there. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and because many of the famous designers from Italy, right, they are, they are graduating in architecture, not, not in industrial design. So I came there and, and uh, when they asked someone from the business school, is there anyone who wants to go and teach to the design school? Uh, it was business administration to, for designers. And I was coming back and saying, you know, why not? Uh, I mean, at least that's the space where, where Italy is excelling. So maybe there is something new to learn. And then everything started. So ju just because I was searching for some new space, it was top in terms of industrial relationship with, with, with the context. Uh, although I have to confess, one day I came back to my notebooks when I was a child, you know, when you're a child, you write this little, little, you know, essays, what you want to do when you will be adults. And that, then I discovered that when I was eight, I wrote, I want to become a designer oh. <laughs> who, who is the person who designs cars. <laughs> <laughs> that was a designer is the person who designed cars. Okay. <laughs> by the <laughs> way, by the way, this is interesting because still today, many adults, not just kids, think that designers are that. They design cars, they design clothing, they work on the aesthetic of some products. There is not a more profound understanding of what a designer is. So, what is a designer for you now, a few years later, after you wrote that? You know, the, 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 the people that design cars, what is for Roberto Verganti a designer today? Well, of course, as always, there are many, many kinds of designer. But to me, the quintessential designer is someone who always asks the question, does it make sense? Uh, whenever you design something, uh, I, mean, I can make a little, I mean, I'm an, I come from engineering. So, so in, in, at that time, engineering was five years of studies, and, and in five years of studies, uh, you know, a classic engineering student is in class, a professor comes, he gives you a big, difficult problem to solve, and you solve it. Actually, the most difficult it is, the cooler it is. And, and I, in five years, I never saw any student raising his hand and say, professor, that problem doesn't make sense. <laughs> never. Because if ever you do it, it's not the professor's the answer, it's your colleagues that tell you, you say it doesn't make sense because you don't know how to solve it. So there is, I mean, as an engineer, you're proud of, you know, we are Marines, you know, we solve problems and, and we are proud of, well, in, a, in the design school, the first problem and you, you said is, hold on a second, professor, but that problem doesn't make sense. And of course, the engineers take jokes of you and say, yeah, because you don't know how to solve it. But, but that's the designer, I mean, does it really make sense? And, and I'm, sometimes I'm sad to realize that in, in the recent years, this, this perspective of design has been a little lost. We increasingly see designers are great, great, great problem solvers. Uh, then, then finding a real difference with an engineer is becoming increasingly difficult. I mean, designers are, are people who really try to make sense of the problems in front of them. I mean, you use the, this word sense and then you often use somehow a synonym of sense that is meaning, right? Your design-driven innovation is a meaningful innovation, is a meaning-driven innovation. Can you elaborate a little bit on this idea of meaning that I think is one of the most profound ideas that you have, that you develop in design-driven innovation first, your first book, and then in Overcrowded later? Yeah, uh, it is really this capability of uh, reframing the problem in front of you in a way that is more meaningful. And, and I mean, nowadays is a very you know, popular word, a kind of buzz where everyone uses meaningful. But in this case, I really mean that everything that is in front of us, every object, every service, every experience, 
uh, has a meaning. I mean, I, I'm not inventing this. There is a lot of research about this. One, probably one of the most famous book is The Meaning of Things by Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, who is a famous psychology, and he wrote a book about the meaning of things. Whenever we do things, we are humans. We give meaning to the things we do, but this meaning over time changes uh, because of several reasons. Because society changes, because uh, there are new technological opportunities. And I mean, I was laughing and the other day. I was watching um, uh, TV with, with, with a member of the family, and and and. and uh, I mean, the television has been, uh, the meaning of a television has been the enemy of the family for a long time. And nowadays, instead, finally, we can all sit in front of a TV instead of everyone looking at his own screen. So I mean, it's, it's changed. The, the meaning of a television has changed significantly. It's, 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 a, it's a social. Instead of unsocial, it's a social device. So society changes and, and the meaning of things change. And, and, uh, and most of the time, if we realize this meaning is enabled by a choice from, from a designer, from someone who's in, has imagined a new possibility, which is not, and this is again coming back to what we said before, the real designer is not the problem solver, it's someone who imagined a future which is not a problem solved future, but is a design future, something that it doesn't start from solving the problem of the past, it's not past dependent, it's imagining things that nowadays they don't even exist. You basically design the problem, you don't solve it, you design it in a way that is more meaningful. And you don't start from the past. What do you think about the role of research, consumer research, testing on, on design-driven innovation in a world where you need to even redefine the problem, design the problem, and then define the meaning of the solution to the problem? Can you test that? Is it possible? Uh, uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, this is not uh, really easy. I mean, in our research and in also the project we do with organization now since, since more than 15 years, uh, the, we are realizing, we are discovered that whenever you want to change the meaning of things, you want to change direction, uh, uh, customers are really, really unlikely to help you. Uh, and we are not the only one discovering this. Probably the most famous theory is from Clayton Christensen the element of innovators. The more you're close to users, the more they, they really trapped you into the path of the past. I mean, the user is using something that exists in the past. So, so you can, I mean, getting close to user is fantastic to improve things, to do things increasingly better in the same direction, but to change direction, users are really, really poor because they have expertise of the past, not of the future. Uh, and also because this kind of innovation, you know, understanding what it makes sense, you cannot put it on a scale. You, you know, if you're designing a car, you want this car to break in a shorter space, you can measure it. But if you ask yourself, that really makes sense to have a car that is standing there 99% of this time, I mean, that kind of reflection, you cannot measure that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's giving meaning to things, it's, it's sense making. And so there's no one who can ever tell you what is right, what is wrong. It really comes from you. Uh, and if it doesn't come from you, at uh, the first challenge you have in innovation process, you stop because you're waiting for an external event to tell you whether to continue. So, I, Mauro, I always use one sentence that you, you, you told me once. Uh, and I borrowed this sentence because it's, you once told me, you know, of course you listen to customer. I mean, you have to listen, but don't believe them. <laughs> 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 Which means, I mean, you need to make sense of, what, of things. Sometimes you listen. I mean, you listen always, but then you say, "Oh, hold on a sec. And you are the expert. We have, as designers, we have responsibilities, not to give people what they want, but what is more meaningful to them. So that, that's our so now connected to this. You have been working with so many major corporations. Uh, when you do, you, when you take your users, your consumers, people with you, and you do incremental innovation on a product or a brand scale, it's not that difficult to grow considerably the revenue of, of the business, the brand, because you already start from a big scale, big scale. Consumers want that incremental innovation and you grow. When you do something more disruptive, it's more difficult. Because especially at the beginning, the early adopters are really, you know, a small percentage of the people that eventually 
are interested on your or understand your your disruptive innovation. And so it's difficult to go at scale rapidly with that kind of innovation. Uh, it takes time. So what's your point of view on uh, on this? Because that difficulty combined with the need of time for people to get used to that more disruptive idea is what often become a major roadblock for big companies to do that kind of disruptive innovation, to pass from a laptop computer to an iPod, to an iPhone, as Apple did, for instance, successfully in the, in the past. That's true. And that's the reason why it's really an innovation that is inside out. I mean, it's, it's come from really from your understanding of what it could be more meaningful to people. Usually I use the sense of what would you love people to love? It's it's what you love, but not for yourself. For what you love, what would you love people to love? So other people is your vision of this people will love this. And you love the idea that people will love this because that idea is what keeps you going on. Uh, and, and it's true. I mean, uh, that's, that's the class, you know, in, in innovation that comes from user is tend to, I mean, you can grow, but then at a given point you saturate because you have been squeezing out everything you could squeeze out. So you always need to take some bigger step, big, big and bad. And this bet is something that, uh, is a longer journey. There will be roadblocks. And the only way to continue is that you believe people will love it. And it's not that you are, you're deaf. I mean, you, you listen, you listen, but, uh, but then you elaborate and, and you adjust. And, and is, there is this internal drive that we, in business, in business schools, we, we are scared about that. Uh, uh, although we slowly, I have to say, and we can talk about this if you like, uh, Actually, why don't we talk about this? Coming back to our introduction, <laughs> when it, when I came in class in the class, you were sitting in that class in, in you know more than twenty years ago, uh, uh, and at that time, as a professor from a business school, I was the enemy in the design school. I mean, oh, I can imagine uh, the thought in those four hundred fifty students. Oh my God, this 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 <laughs> professor now you know talk about business and business is dirty, you know. Uh, especially in design school where there was this, you know, anti-establishment, you know, we want to change the world. And this guy come and he teaches us how to make money. And this, sometimes I'm sad because in this moment, in the world of business, there is an increasing will to do things for the good. Now, to do things well, to, we say, to bring purpose into organization. So the business community is moving closer to the creation of the good, of meaning for people. And instead, the design community started to talk the language of business, you know, design thinking, the processes, the tools, and, and innovation, and don't be scared, uh, you know, there is a process. And so it's almost that there's been a switch. And, and, and the world of design, because, we, of course, the great thing is that we want to, to make design more palatable to, to, to business people, we start to talk their language. Uh, and and I, sometimes I tell to people in design, don't worry, I, I'm quite good in speaking business language. Be a designer because what business people lead is not a mini business person, it's a real designer. And that kind of critical attitude is exactly what the business person needs in this moment. Maybe 20 years ago, no, but now business people are searching for that critical attitude and a little bit of risk and a little bit of vision. I completely agree um, sometimes you see designers that lose themselves and as you say become mini business person often you know an average <laughs> mediocre business person because she's not your background but you lose the value i think what is important though is to keep to preserve somehow the ability to talk the business language so that you become a partner you become what I call a co-conspirator instead of a tool, you know, even if you are a human being, but, you know, somebody to be leveraged and used by a different community. I think this, you know, peer-to-peer -peer relation between business and design, bringing to the table different perspectives, but also using a language that is accessible to each other, that is understandable by the two communities, is really, really key. But you're right. I, we, we are witnessing so many designers losing their essence of designer and becoming less valuable to organizations that don't need people that are not that kind. Yeah, of. 
and I mean, it, it, 20 years ago, it made sense, of course. It made sense because the, the two worlds were so far from each other that you needed to do this step. But nowadays, they are even, they're becoming so close that they, they, they think inertia, they're crossing each other the other way around. So in a way, my feeling is that many business people nowadays really, really understand and actually they are searching for a more meaningful way of doing business. Everyone talks about purpose. The reason why they need the design nowadays is that they don't know how to make it happen. So it's a, in a way, forgive me if I say, but it's the practical side of things that they miss. It's not the, the, the visionary because that, that's it. They're, they're, the two words are getting closer. But then there is this fantastic power of design that they are not only sense makers, they are doers. Uh, and, and, uh, and especially they work on the real core of every organization, which is product, services, experiences. It's the real stuff. They work on the real stuff. Uh, going back to, to innovation and, and also your books and your theories, um, often you use a graph where on the vertical axis you have performance slash technology and the, on the horizontal you have meaning and sometimes you call it language as well but meaning and performance and you have example and then you have incremental performance change and then disruptive or radical performance change and the same for meaning and different examples uh, of Increment, uh, performance driven innovation, incremental or more or less incremental, and meaning driven innovation, more or less incremental. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's a very, especially through examples, is a very powerful way to explain the world what you mean with mean, meaning, meaning driven innovation or meaningful innovation. And especially, I think, the magic of when you mix performance and meaning, where the magic happens. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a very good point. I, I can use, I mean, maybe a very simple example that that is, is a little old, but but sometimes simple examples are more powerful. Uh, in the world of game consoles, uh, I mean, the classic meaning, the example I use is always the example of the innovation introduced by the Nintendo Wii, which is a product that everyone knows. So uh, before the Nintendo Wii. The meaning of a game console is, you know, I, I play with a game console. Why? That's the meaning. The why? It's, you know, because I want to enter into a, into another world, into virtual reality. I can I can be Cristiano Ronaldo. I can be a soldier. I die, but I don't die. So it's you really enter into a virtual space and being someone else was the meaning of traditional game consoles. And then you can make incremental change. You know, you, you incremental change. I mean, you know, there is a way to play with like this, and, and and then you can you know put another button there because you know there's a finger that is still free. So but in the meaning that yeah. your ability is, is what matters, you can make radical change in the same direction. You know, you can have when when the PlayStation Three and the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty came out in the market, they, they had a chip inside which was the cell by IBM, which way forward in terms of performance, really a breakthrough in terms of speed. So you can see all the graphic because you're interested in the, into, into this virtual world and you want this virtual world to be precise. You want to see a drop of the rain. Uh, and, uh, but the Nintendo, we came and, and they changed the meaning and say, okay, you know what? Uh, we, we play by moving and, and play by moving means it doesn't, it doesn't care. You become someone else. You play yourself. You, you don't become beyond boring and play tennis. You play tennis yourself. And it's the way you move, the way you socialize. Actually, one one more thing there is wrong because it's about socializing. So it's, if you make it difficult, people, it's great for the great player, but it's not great to socialize with others. So the meaning from competition to socialize is to, from being someone else to being yourself and, and, and get your body better uh, is a radical change of meaning. Okay. So, so we have this, you know, you can have in radical changes in performance, same direction, 10 times better in terms of speed and graphic, but the meaning is the same, or, or you can change the meaning of things and, and, uh, and reinvent yourself. And, and we know the impact. In that case, that is an example that I use also because this, the, the, the impact was suddenly so, you know, people got it rapidly and, and it sold twice as much as the other two. Now, let's say that I am the CEO of a company or a business leader and I, I lead a brand, a product portfolio, and I understand what you're talking about. I understand that I need to innovate with meaning in mind. I understand also how to do it. I read your books. I know the process, the tools. 
And then you see people applying those theories or companies applying those theories and being very successful. And then you see other companies applying exactly the same theories and not being successful. I, these are not the theories of Roberto. In general, you, you, you understand the same thinking. You apply, you're successful. You apply, you are not successful. I've been seeing this for many years, you know, in my own experience, observing other companies. And I started to think, okay, why, why the same tools and different results? And then the answer become very obvious at a certain point. It's all about the people behind those tools, the questions that they ask, uh, the way they observe the reality. You said it earlier, uh, listening to consumers, not believing them means that you need to interpret. And interpretation is driven by your way of thinking, your intuition, your empathy, your sharpness of thinking. So people are important and often companies and, and books and academies talk so much about processes and tools that they don't spend enough time to define what is the ideal innovator. So how, how important it is in your mind, uh, the person behind those processes and tools, and what is then the ideal innovator? What are the characteristics, the traits of the ideal innovator? First of all, I, 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 I cannot agree more. Uh, you say something interesting there about the theories. Design is not a theory. Maybe design thinking, that kind of process is a theory, but design is not a theory. Design is a practice. I mean, you can have good design, but you also can have bad design, as you can have good management and bad management. So, so um, that's the kind of narrative that I think and I hope the community will use soon. It's, it's not that design is good. Design is design. I mean, it's not that you never hear any managers going around and say, you know what, management is good. No, no, actually, we, we do exactly the opposite. We explicitly say management can be bad, and, and but it can also be good because that's the real way that you save the discipline because otherwise every time you fail, but then it's not true that management is not good. Yeah, exactly. Management can also be bad. Yeah. And you need to learn how to turn bad management into good management. So we need to start saying there is bad design and good design. And that's the reason why the people who makes design becomes very important because even, even if everyone uses the same tools, <laughs> there is good ways of use. It's not good ways of use. There's great people and, 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 and more inspired and, and, and people is probably better in doing other kind of things. And, and so uh, to the point that I'm doing a, a project, an important project with a cor large corporation in this moment uh, in Japan, uh, unfortunately, I cannot, I cannot disclose the name, but uh, I came, you know, over the years, given the, when you work with corporation, they, they keep asking me, what is the process? What are the steps? And also design driven innovation, changing meaning. You can find the tools and in overcrowded that described, but they say, you know, a professor, why don't we simply make a meeting? It's eight people from the leadership team. You sit with us. It was sitting on Zoom and we just talk on the meaning of our product, of course. And I was so touched. And so finally, you know, this was, I mean, it's, if I will tell you the name, you will never believe it. Uh, but, then, I, uh, then I guess I know <laughs> what you're then, talking about. And then it was the most fantastic two hours of meeting in which in two hours, we really reflected deeply, you know, talking about the meaning of things. It's like when you're in front of fire and you talk about the meaning of life, you don't need to have a process to talk about the meaning of life. You need to talk and be inspired, of course, and be good people. So uh, what are... What are the characteristics of, of, of these people is great in, at least in design-driven innovation in this change of new meaning? I would say, first, they are reflective, uh, which is a little different than, than the classic fast uh, execution. Blah, 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 let's do it and then we try. No, 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 hold on a second. You can always do things, but then you stop and you reflect. And there is a fantastic theory about this by a famous professor from actually come from the eighties, Donald Schoen, about the reflective practitioner. I mean, designer is a reflective practitioner. You you do a drawing or you do a prototype, but then you stop and you reflect what you have been doing, and that's the real design moment. Does it make sense what I did? So reflect is self-critical, self-critical, and then curious. 
But, but curious, not playful. Uh, it's really curious. Whenever you see something that it doesn't match what you see, it's not curiosity like a child. Let me search. No, no, it's, ah, this is painful. Uh, why this guy tell me this thing and I don't see it? And that's the curiosity start because you, you, while in business school, we always teach students to, to be good in judgment, you know, should I choose A or B? The reflective practitioner, like a real designer, so you see A, you see B, you see A, you see B. Now, hold on a second, why? I, I see this one, but this person said it. And finally you find, and you solve the paradox and you find C, which, you know, brings together these two things. That's the real innovation. It's not that you throw thousands of ideas. It's this tension that, that is very important if you want to bring design at the leadership level, because you will, the, the point is really there when you're at the leadership level. There are tension and you come there and you don't say this is better than this one. No. Wow. You see this and I see that. How can we bring this? Either one of us is stupid, but it's not. Or we simply see two slices of the same thing. How can we bring them together? It requires a lot of creativity. You mentioned the word leadership and, and obviously it's a word very important for PepsiCo, for any company and, and, because at the end of the day, those leaders are the ones driving the companies in the right direction. You uh, recently started an initiative, you are in Stockholm right now, and you are working on the connection between design and leadership. Can, can you tell us more about this initiative? Yes, uh, <laughs> I was smiling because in this moment it was snowing outside. There is the sun, but it's snowing. Oh. Uh, so we are really in Stockholm. Uh, but... Um, uh, what I'm doing here, I created a new center at the House of Innovation of the Stockholm School of Economics. And given this is the House of Innovation, I say, okay, I will call the center the garden because <laughs> every house has a garden. So I will take care of the garden. And the garden is the center for design and leadership. So the vision is uh, that I believe, and we come back to this idea of I believe that people will love it. Uh, I believe that design can bring a great contribution to this hunger of business for a new way of looking at leadership. There is this hunger, you know, a lot of people talk about purpose. Students coming up to, from business school start to say, I don't want just to make money. Yeah, of course, I mean, that, that's, there's nothing wrong about that, but I want to create a more meaningful world. I, and, and, and you see from my students, uh, but they don't have the tools. They don't have, they don't have the, the, they have the will and the wish. So it's a great moment because design, first of all, as, as we said before, it is already there. It's about the meaning of things. So that's, that's, we are already there. So, so we, we are aligned in this one. We don't even need to convince the managers. They are, they're already there. But the second thing is that we have uh, and sorry if I put myself into the design community, <laughs> if I don't have a design degree. But the second thing we have is, is the capability to make things real. I mean, I've been doing a little research study a few months ago, looking at the purpose statement. You know, many companies now, they have a purpose statement. Yeah. You know, we want to change the world. So we did, uh, we did a study in the world of uh, finance, Oh, you know, you had the banks, purpose statement. And then we did a conference and we showed three purpose statements, one from the bank, one from a supermarket, and one from a fashion company. And we asked people, can you guess what is the finest company here? And they were all the, you know, can you can imagine our purpose to make the world a better place and safer and whatever it is. And eventually everyone picked the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> So they are so high level that, that they are, as always, there is meaningless. So, so the power of design is to really bring purpose of thing down, down to what? Down to product and services, because that's the reason why organizations do exist. They exist because they do product and services. So when you really reflect on the meaning of the product, of, of, of this can of, of, of Pepsi you have in front of you, of this pen here, and, and it means I'm trying to be a little more modern than, than because I'm using a pad instead of using a piece of paper. But when you really get close to that, uh, then you're transferring your 
high level will of changing the world into really changing the world because you change the world through these things. So design has this short circuit between the, the wheel and the hand, which is really unique. So I always tell uh, to this, I don't lose your capability of doing because this is what makes the real difference. And we can talk about aesthetics as well, if you like. But I want to, but oh, yeah, we'll talk about that. Let's remember. Um, but you, you talked about purpose um, a lot. And um, obviously talking about purpose immediately come to mind uh, the events of the past couple of years and especially the past year. First, all the attention on, on gender, the Me Too movement, then Black Lives Matter, and more recently, unfortunately, uh, especially here in the United States, all this hate against Asian and, you know, the Chinese vi virus and something that is really so difficult to understand and yet so common in human nature. We see it out there. We need to make an effort to remember there are so many billions of people that are good human beings and we need to fight somehow all that hate with kindness and with love and with empathy. But could, and with design. Uh, and, and so the, the question was going there. So going back <laughs> to companies and design, you know, companies are, many companies, including PepsiCo where I work, are taking a position or making a statement that they have a very clear point of view on, on those matters, diversity in general, you know, the purpose of the company. So how design can help in all of this? You mentioned it partially, but talking literally about the theme of diversity, uh, how design can help in this area? I, I think that design is probably one of the practices that can help most in this case. Uh, and uh, I, I take it from a very peculiar perspective, but we have been doing a couple of projects on Gen Z recently in different spaces. Uh, and Gen Z is quite unique and it, you know, it's the generation that will come next. So, and it's not only that they will come in 20 years because you know, the last, the last generation was the oldest people now look at. So it's not anymore like in the past, they were looking at the adults. It's the adults who are looking at the youngest people. So they will really shape society soon. And for the young generation, I mean, if you take, gender or, or, or skin or, or any kind of diversity. Uh, in the past, we know there was one way of being. The one was, if you're a male, you, you need to be a male. I mean, and if, you're, if, you're, if you work in the skin, you need to be white and, and, and to the point that people you know, work in the skin. And, and, uh, and, and if you have hair, you need to be blonde, uh, all these kind of things. But Gen Z is totally different and, and it's different in a very peculiar way because it's not that these problems don't matter anymore. It's not that the skin of your skin, because that could have been a direction, the color of your skin, your gender, the color of your hair, what you wear, it doesn't matter. Oh, if it's, it's you know, rich, poor, uh, old, young, old, young or something, no, it doesn't matter. We are all the same. No, it still matters a lot like before but everyone can be the gender, the skin, the dress, the whatever they like. Uh, and people is increasingly becoming a designer of their life. I mean, you can see it in gender. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's not what, it, what your identity card says, it's what you feel. Uh, and if I feel I want to be gay, I'm gay. And, and But if tomorrow I want to change again because I feel different, I change again. I'm not even static. In, into, and it's totally fine. But when I'm there, I really want to be there. So diversity is not, doesn't mean that these differences don't matter. Every, it matters a lot what is your color of your skin and, and your gender, but you can be whatever you like, which means you can, this is a moment in which people, the Gen Z, want to create their identity. And, and that's the space of design. Imagine what, how can you change the world if you enable people to create their identity. As a designer, I give you the tools to become who you want to become. 
it's there, this is the moment in which we can, as design community, we can have an impact that is amazing, giving people the capability to create their identity. You need a lot of creativity to do that. That's a very interesting idea. And I think also with the social media platforms, then you have a further amplification of any self-expression that you can imagine for yourself. Is that happening already? Exactly. I think there is talking about tools now in a very positive way, what are the right tools to also guide people in this journey to define yourself? That is so, by the way, is part of the pursuit of happiness is, is a very important component of the uh, Maslow pyramid is literally, you know, a way to reach your happiness once you fulfill the basic needs. So it's not a nice to have is at the very base of uh, exactly. social happiness in our entire society. Um, you mentioned aesthetic before we, you know, I changed topic. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions about aesthetic, but before anything else, what did you want to say about aesthetic? You mentioned it. And... Well, uh, I still remember, Mauro, you invited me uh, to an exhibition at the Salone del Mobile at the Design Fair in Milan a few years ago. And you had, for, probably was one of the first or second year you were in Pepsi, I think. And I came in and I was immersed into a world of colors that I never saw before. And you were anticipating what's happening now, actually, because I start to see the same colors in movies and cartoons nowadays. So you were five or six years ahead of time. And, and and this idea of being immersed into a new space, it, you know, I was really feeling ah, elevated, you know, I was feeling good. And with this idea that designers are problem solvers, we, 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 we take the humanity out of life. <laughs> and, and, and aesthetic is very important because aesthetic is giving meaning through immersion. I mean, we, we don't only give meaning to think by solving equations and, and, and functionalities. Uh, aesthetic is functionality. Aesthetic is a statement. Uh, it's, it's much more powerful because you don't need to explain anything. It's there. You, you, you can change much more the world through the power of the design language that you use than by the functionalities that you deliver. It's really the idea that you don't keep the distance between you and the object or the experience. It's, aesthetic is immersion. And, and, and we have the duty as designer to be very careful in not using that kind of capability because we, we, we don't, the only way to change the world and not to change the mind of people is to change their heart. And you don't change the heart through functionalities, you change the heart through aesthetics. I, I love it so much. At the end of the day, aesthetic is at the service of the creation of meaning. I mean, and, and that's why it all starts with people and ends with people. You need to deeply, deeply understand that people are going to use and enjoy your products and then understanding what kind of meaning they search, needs and wants together, functionality and emotionality together. And, and then... Aesthetic is therefore a very, very important lever to create, to reach that kind of goal. And, and you're so right. I, in so many conversations about processes and strategies, sometimes we lose the, the, the recognition, the, the importance of, of aesthetic in, in all of this. And by the way, aesthetic is very qualitative somehow. I mean, there is a quantitative component, very objective, but there is also a very, very, very subjective component of aesthetic. Uh, there is not, you, can, you may have multiple good aesthetic solutions to the same kind of problem. And that's where, once again, therefore, the uh, intuition, the sensitivity uh, of, of the designer, the entrepreneur, the innovator, the person driving the project becomes extremely, extremely important. What there about sustainability? Kind of uh, sorry, about, go ahead. <laughs> talking about um, 
purpose, talking about uh, a society that is evolving and changing. And, and then we are talking from the platform of PepsiCo, a company uh, that produces packaging that goes you know, in the houses and in the life of billions of people around the world. For us, sustainability obviously is a very important topic and we have a variety of different initiatives to make our portfolio as sustainable as possible. Um, what's your point of view on sustainability, how sustainability is changing in the society and what is the role of design to create a more sustainable world, but not just in isolation, the, world of, the role of design in connection with products and companies and brands on one side, people out there, because people also play a role. They, you know, we need to understand what are the behaviors of people, how they use their products, how they recycle and reuse their products. And then the role eventually, uh, there is also the role of the media, the governments, all the third parties that are there observing or enabling certain behaviors. Uh, so what's your point of view on design, sustainability and the world we live in? Um. This is very, uh, very interesting. By the way, then, then I will uh, take this and then I go back to the, to the vision that I'm having here in Stockholm because it, it's connected to this. Uh, there, are, uh, there are, first of all, one of the problems of user-centered design is that unfortunately it's not sustainable. Uh, what does it mean? That uh, one thing is to solve the problem of a user or, or to give meaning to users but not always what is good for a user is good for society at large. Not always what is good for a user is good for the environment. So, so the perspective of being on the you know, user center is a little bit dangerous in that. That is why we need new perspectives. And there is, a, here in Stockholm, there is, Dan Hill is the design strategist of Innova, which is the state agency for innovation. And, and he used this name, citizen center design, which is it's quite intriguing because Imagine you're designing a car, you know, that, that is the classic of the designer. And, but one thing is to design the car for the user, you know, they know he's driving there. But the same user is a person who is a citizen, and the next day he will cross the street. And, and when he crosses the street, he doesn't want to be hurt by the car. And then the next day he's taking his children to school, and when he's walking in the streets, he doesn't want to breathe the gas. So uh, it's, 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 what's the way to say? It's not, we don't want to to miss the, the peculiarity of design that is really people-centered. But moving from being user-centered to be citizen-centered is the way to say that the same person interact with this experience as a citizen from many, many different ways. If you only look at the user, it's just, okay, you, you can make the user happy, which probably will buy the product. But the same user, the next day is a citizen, which is looking at that product used by someone else and it created a disaster. So, so I find it very inspiring. The, the, the second perspective that I that I have about this, of course, is a perspective of meaning. And basically, I classify two kinds of meaning when you talk about sustainability. One is sustainability as a differentiator. An example, Patagonia. Okay, so in that case, sustainability is what makes the difference. The other perspective, what I call sustainability as a gift. What does it mean? You buy your 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 product, and, and your, but you don't buy it because it's sustainable. But then it's not okay. But then technically it's sustainable. No, it's a gift. So you open this product, start to use, and then you discover that, wow, it is also sustainable and it's great. So you don't you don't you don't buy this because it's more sustainable than the others. But you discover this as a gift, and this gift comes from whom? From the designer, who has been thinking about this without asking me to make compromises. And this is very important because the first perspective, design as a differentiator, bring the trade-off to the user. Okay, I buy this thing. I would like to buy a more fashionable product, but I buy this because it's more sustainable. It's not as cool. So I need to make a trade-off between cool and sustainable. Okay, I would like to have Gucci, but uh, I go Patagonia because. So you, the designer has been transferring the trade-off to me. I need to make a compromise. Design sustainability as a gift instead is, oh, this is such a cool product. And, oh, let me see. It's also sustainable. So who has been taking care of the trade-off? The designer. And, and, and I think that, that 
the, the, the shortcut of only thinking about sustainability as something that people care for, no, it's the designer needs to care for it. Thank you for giving me this gift, which I can still have my cool stuff, but it's sustainable. That's the gift. I look, I profoundly, profoundly agree with this idea and and that should be always the goal. Too many times we design products, services, experience, packaging, thinking about the compromise you need to take. I think, so that's a message for us, designers, innovators, brands. I think also though, there is a message for the, for the society and the consumer. Sometimes that's not possible because maybe today with the technologies we have, the materials that we have, the compromise, the avoiding the compromise may cost too much to the consumer or make it, make the product unfeasible for the company. Uh, and so there is, I think, a second message that I think is extremely important today, and especially the media need to carry the message, is that there is in this journey towards the perfect product, towards the product where there is no compromise anymore, but is a journey and each player needs to play a role if we want to advance the sustainability agenda as fast as possible. So there is space for a product that maybe you need to reuse or to recycle, even though the ideal product maybe is the one that is sold itself in the environment or that doesn't pollute at all and is still perfect from a functional and aesthetic standpoint. So this idea of the journey hand in hand, there is not one against the other. Consumers with companies, with governments, with media, all together with the same agenda to change the world, I think is a very important message because if we have antagonism, and people pointing the finger at companies not creating the perfect solution. Then you work in the companies, you're like, gosh, I'm trying to do everything I can, but there are these constraints. And yeah, I know that maybe technology will help in a few years. And maybe, you know, there is research going on in this other field. And so I think is a tension for us. I think your message is very powerful. We need to find the ideal product for people that they will buy, no matter if it's, I mean, sustainability is, wow, it's also sustainability. I like how you say it. But in the meantime, while we get there, let's work together on, on what exactly. are some of the trade-offs we need to take as a society to change things as rapidly as possible. I like, I like this idea of the journey and the journey together and, and where everyone takes care of the, and, or their own uh, responsibility. So the customer can take on a little bit of, of their trade-off and the company a little bit of the trade-off and everyone put a little bit there. Uh, and that's the way, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's no magic wand. Yeah. Look, we could go on and on and on for hours talking as usual. We always have these long conversations, uh, most of the time offline. Um, two questions just to wrap up and close. One is, is there any message you want to leave us with? And second, I know, you know, in backstage, I saw a guitar close to you. It's almost becoming a tradition. Fabio Novembre played a little piece for us in Italian, in one of the last episodes. Do you want to play something for us? Italian, English, whatever you want, quickly, like 20 seconds, just to say goodbye. Uh, I will try. Uh, first, uh, maybe... The message, I think the message is what we have been discussing today in all single topic. Uh, I didn't prepare this, but it came out now. I, it, it is the summary of our conversation maybe is, let's try to be, let's, as designers, as, as, as deeply designers as we can. Uh, there, is, there is an increasing need of real design. I mean, don't try to become business designer or business model. Do your job because we, instead, the community of management and business needs that incredibly. So go you know, deeply in your profession. Don't be scared. If you're a designer, it's not because you're, you're not a failed business student. If you are in design because you love that. So don't, don't be shy and, and uh, be as designer as you can. I think that, that that's whatever that means for you. Uh, that's, I think, is the message because we need real design. Um, by the way, it, the thing that I, that I wanted to mention at what I'm doing here in Stockholm, what we are trying to do, we are trying to design because also professors are designing, we design program. In this moment, we are designing a, a, a leadership program which is really inspired by design. So there is a new way to 
is a new leadership development program entirely inspired by design. Uh, and maybe uh, now in the, we are in the constant development phase. Uh, so maybe one day I will have a chance to talk to you a little more deeply about this. But uh, uh, it is really the, the perspective we believe that there is a mindset of design that can help leaders. Blanky, if people want to find more information about this, where they should go? Into our mind, because it's still... <laughs> They just contact me, and, and, and that's that's uh, that's uh, it. Will be probably launching in January 2022. Okay. Uh, so, so but I guess at by that time, if anybody's listening to us in in that time frame, Google Roberto Verganti. What is the leadership Stockholm? Probably you will find something. They come to my website verganti.com and they find my address. But what I'm searching for in this moment, what I'm searching for is a few very inspired pioneer who wants to co-design this with us. So that's what I'm searching for in this month. So not many would be quite small, probably 10 participants, 11, not, not, so we want to do it very, very, very unique. Uh, and in this moment we are pulling together this 10 participants. who want, they were starting January 2022, but we want to design the initiative together. Like, it's, yeah. a, it's a real co-design. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Play us. Okay. <laughs> Let me see here what we have. Okay. Okay, let's try. I will not sing because that's really not mine. <laughs> I stop here. For those who realize this is Genesis 1973. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Roberto, for <laughs> this last gift. We were talking about gifts. Thank that's you for this gift. last gift and for the gift of this conversation today. Great design, by the way. That's another great example of design. <laughs> <laughs> Mauro, thank you. It's been uh, great. It's always a pleasure. I hope that, that people is listening. I've been having fun, as always. I've been learning a lot from you inspiring questions and uh, hope we can do this again Absolutely. maybe in front of a in, in front of some wine soon soon thank you ciao ciao ciao, ciao.